that cradle the birthplace of stars. 
Behold, the old has passed away, the new has come. Abba, that you would humble us as you see fit. May we sit at your feet where we need not strive to exist. For we thrive where your mercies persist, yet how long will we run? How long will we run? Come, what may you say? <laughs> Father, you say, what may will come, but may you not come undone when what may does come. <laughs> Abba, Jehovah sit can know every knee will bow to you. Every tongue confess that you are Lord. <laughs> Jehovah sit can know every knee will bow to you. Every tongue confess that you are Lord.
family and all of our friends that are tuning in this Sunday morning. I want to send you warm, warm greetings all the way from Thomas's farm. We thank God for the way he has preserved and kept um, Uganda, our families, the whole nation during this time of lockdown. And we believe that by the grace of God, we're coming out of this long uh, tunnel and we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. So I just want to encourage you this morning with the words from Isaiah 60, which say, Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. God bless you, and thank you so much, everyone who sent me warm, warm birthday wishes. We are having a scientific birthday here at the farm with just um, our close family. But God willing, when the lockdown is ended, we'll be able to share a big birthday cake with everyone at church. God bless you. To all our first time visitors, you are welcome. To connect with us, follow us on all our social media platforms Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. For tithes and offerings, please use the mobile money and account number on your screen. Covenant Nations Church for the Kingdom. Good morning, CNC family, and all of our friends who are tuning in for our Sunday morning online service. I want to thank you for making the time to be with us today, and I want to thank you for being a part of Covenant Nations Church through our online platforms. It has been a privilege and an honor to share the Word of God with you these last couple of weeks um, on this platform. And um, I just sense in my spirit that there is light at the end of the tunnel. We thank God for the way that he has preserved and, and just protected us all during this season of lockdown. And I just sense that we're coming out, of, you know, coming out of this lockdown soon by the grace of God. And we probably have just a few more, you know, sessions to share, maybe two or three at most, I believe that we'll be sharing uh, online before, by the grace of God, we're able to, to fellowship again um, in, in person. So I want to thank everybody for being part of you know, this online service, and I want to pray that the Lord will bless you today. The word that the Lord put on my heart this morning is just one again of encouragement from Isaiah 60, which just says, Arise and shine. For your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And it says that uh, darkness will cover the earth and gross darkness, the nations, but God's light will rise upon you and will be seen upon you. So it's just an encouragement that God's light is uh, shining and God's light is arising on his people. And I believe in a very special way in Uganda and in Africa. So today we're just continuing on with our teaching that we've been doing the last couple of weeks under the theme, Jesus is Africa. So this is Jesus is Africa part six, and uh, God willing, we will be concluding this you know, theme in the next two or, or three sessions, just a, a few more to go. But I thank you for staying with us, for staying with me as I've shared 
this word. So today we're going to talk about the Joseph Company. We are bringing the message home to the individual, to to you, the person that is listening and has been listening to these messages. And I'll encourage you, if you haven't been listening to our messages and you haven't been you know, part of, of this series, I encourage you to go back and listen to the first you know, five so that you can be on the same page with us today. All that we have heard and learned over the past couple of weeks, what does that mean for you and me on a personal level? I believe that every word from the Lord comes with personal responsibility. So I have a responsibility to discharge this message as the Lord has put it on my heart. And by the grace of God and by the help of His Holy Spirit, I have been doing that. But once that word is discharged, once that word goes forth and is imparted, there is a responsibility on the listener. What do you do with what the Lord is speaking to you and to me in this time? In the last session, we prayed that God God would raise up a company of Josephs. What does it mean to be part of a company of Josephs? So what does it mean to be part of the Joseph generation? I believe it simply means to be a person who is called and anointed by God to solve problems uh, in the different sectors or mountains or spheres of our society. The seven mountains of our society are family, the mountain of family, the mountain of the church, the mountain of education, the mountain of media, the mountain of culture or arts, the mountain of economy and the mountain of government. So wherever God has called you to serve and to to lead or to to minister, it will be on one of one or even more than one of those seven mountains. So if he has called you to to teach, that will be on the mountain of education. If he has called you to be a minister of the gospel, that is the mountain of the church. If he has called you to to serve as uh, in an institution of government, that is uh, on the mountain of government. If he has called you to be a business person, that is on the mountain of economy and so on and so forth. So to be part of this Joseph generation simply means to be someone who is called and anointed or empowered by God to solve problems and solve the the grapple with the issues that are facing the different mountains in our society. So we're going to look uh, very briefly today at the life of Joseph because we're looking at this company of Josephs or this Joseph generation. And so there was something unique and specific about Joseph that made him a leader in his generation, but also made him someone who impacted the world in a very, very unique and powerful way. So we're going to be looking uh, very briefly at his life and seeing what we can glean from his life and from his journey with God. So the life of Joseph was, uh, we're going to look at it in, in the different stages that he went through and the process that he went through, the process of the vision and, and the, the purpose of God being worked out in his life. And what is so interesting is that we can look at it now with this vantage point of seeing his, his whole life, but imagine Joseph at these different stages. And that's how it is with, with many of us or with all of us, because we don't many times understand the stages that we're going through. Sometimes we only see the hardship or we only see the struggle or we only see the pain and we don't get that uh, eagle's eye or bird's eye view of this whole life that is in, that's actually in, in the process of, of being worked out. So in the beginning, the first uh, place that we uh, encounter Joseph is, uh, is, is early in his life, um, Genesis 37, uh, verse 5 to 11. We see that early in his life, when he was around, you know, a teenager, maybe in his early to mid-teens, he received a vision from God. And this vision was very clear about the dream or the purpose of um, God for Joseph. So Joseph knew early on that there was something uh, different and something unique that he was supposed to accomplish in his life. And in his dreams, uh, we all know the dreams, he had two different dreams and in these dreams he sees his family or symbols of his family, his brothers and even his parents bowing down to him. So it just shows that he was going, he had a purpose that was going to uh, lift him up to a place of, of, of authority that even his parents and the rest of his brothers would bow down to him. Now what's interesting and what we need to note is that these dreams were from God. Joseph didn't make up these dreams. He didn't, you know, come up with them on his own. 
he didn't even necessarily want them. They were, they were dreams that were given to him by God. And so early on, he understood or he embraced the dream and the vision that God had for his life. And that's something that if you look at the Bible, you see that people who understand or come into the vision of God for their life at a young age usually attain success at a young age because they have embraced the vision of God for their lives as opposed to those who fight the vision or maybe align themselves with God's vision later on in their lives. So we see the life of Joseph, but also we see the life of, of David. David was also someone who, who embraced God's vision for his life at an early age. And so he succeeded at an early age. And so the first point of the process is the vision, the vision of our lives. Joseph's vision was from God. It wasn't his own vision. And so he embraced the vision and the purpose of God early on. And that's something that we're going to look at a little later when we look at our own lives. What is the vision that we have embraced? Is it from God or is it uh, from somewhere else? Now, the second place that um, a part of the process that Joseph goes through after the first stage of seeing the vision and the dream of God for his life. And probably Joseph thought that, you know, his life was going to be lived out with his family in Canaan, that somehow, in some way, God was going to, you know, use him in his the, the land of his birth in Canaan. But what happens next is, if you were watching a movie or reading a book, it would be a plot twist because something completely different from what Joseph expected happened. He is rejected by the people that he loves, the people that he trusts, the people that he, you know, is not on guard with. He's rejected by his family. And in Genesis chapter 36, verse 19, he is sold into slavery by his brothers. Verse 19 to 20 says, And they said one to another, See, here comes this dreamer. So you see that they're rejecting him, but also rejecting the vision and the, and, and the dream of God for his life. Here comes this dreamer and master of dreams. So come, let us kill him and throw his body into the pit. Then we will say to our father, some animal has devoured him and we shall see what shall come of his dreams. So he is rejected by his family and the rejection is not only of him, but it is also of the, the call and the vision and the dream of God for his life. So they say, let us kill him and then we will see what will come of his dreams. And what is so interesting in the story of Joseph is that you see that if God gives you the dream, it's not just your own dream, it's not just your own ambition or desire, God has given you that dream. That dream cannot be killed and therefore you cannot be killed because you have not yet fulfilled the dream and the vision of God for your life. So no, no matter how much his family rejected him and, and, and sought to destroy him and destroy the dream and the vision of God in his life, it couldn't be killed. It had to come to fruition. So they sought to, to kill his, his dreams and they rejected him and they rejected his dream. And the test of rejection, especially by the people that you love, respect or admire, is a test of identity. The fundamental test of rejection is the test of identity. If our identity is found in people, then when people reject us, when people reject you, whether it's people in your family or people in your workplace or people in whatever group that you, you belong to, friends, if your identity is bound up in those people or in that association, you will experience an identity crisis because you cannot see yourself outside of this group of people. Your identity is tied to these people. But Joseph's identity was not tied only to his family, but much more so his identity was tied to his relationship with God. So even when the people that he, he least expected to, to reject him, or the, the, the people where it was, it was most painful to, to be rejected by, even when they rejected him, he did not have an identity crisis. He did not question who he was and, and this vision and this dream for his life because his identity was bound up in God and that hadn't changed, even though his relationship, his status in life, his place, his home, everything else had changed, but his relationship with God was still constant. And therefore, Joseph was able to remain who he was. His identity in Christ wasn't changed. And that is a test that all of us as believers and as people who are on this journey will have to go through. What is our identity based on? Is it based on our education? Is it based on our family? Is it based on our status? Is it based on material? belongings? Is it based on what is it based on? Is it based on what we look like, where we come from? If we, if we base 
who we are on all those very uh, uncertain things, then if anything changes or if anything is shaken, then we will have a crisis because what we have tied our identity to has been shaken. But Ephesians chapter 1 verse 6 says, we have already been accepted in the beloved. That just means that no matter what happens to these other things in our lives, these other pillars or these other places that give us a sense of belonging, even, even if all those things are shaken, if our identity is found in Christ, if we know that we are already accepted in the beloved, then our identity will be strong will be firm, will be unshaken. And that's what happened with Joseph. Even though he was rejected by his brothers, the vision of God for his life was rejected. His identity was sure because his, his identity was in Christ, in God, and not in people, and even not in his family. And that's a very important thing for believers, that we need to know who we are in Christ first, before every other thing. And that is the only way that we will be sure and will be firm and will be building on a firm foundation. The third part of the process of Joseph's life was another difficult situation that he went through after being sold, after the rejection of his brothers. He was sold into, into slavery, into Potiphar's house, and he served there, and he was a very faithful steward of Potiphar's house, but he faced great temptation, and uh, he was tempted by Potiphar's wife, and when he refused her advances, refused her the way she was trying to seduce him, he was betrayed. He was betrayed and he was lied about and he was um, thrown into prison unjustly on, you know, there were no grounds for his imprisonment, but he was lied, lied about and he was betrayed. Now, the test of, of this stage or the test of, of betrayal is a test of, of integrity. Joseph's integrity was tested in Potiphar's house. Remember, in the second stage, it was his identity that was tested. In the third stage, it was his integrity that was tested. And anyone who will be used of God in any way will be tested in the area of their moral integrity. And the moral integrity moral integrity just encompasses everything that, 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 that we can be tempted by. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's from 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. Our flesh and the things that tempt our flesh are the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And if you want to just bring it down to the natural, the lust of the flesh talks about sexual immorality or sexual temptation. The lust of the eyes talks about money, mammon, and the pride of life talks about power. So those are the three major areas that we face temptation in, whether it's money or it's sexual temptation or sexual immorality and power. And we will be tested in those major areas areas and you look at any ministry that was successful where the leaders the leadership of the ministry faced temptation or even people in any positions of authority christians or even non-christians or secular the three major areas are the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life now joseph was tested on the lust of the flesh which was uh, sexual immorality he was seduced he was being tempted to you know to sleep with potiphar's wife and he rejected her advances he rejected you know that temptation he was able to overcome that temptation and he was only able to overcome that because of a greater fear of the lord he had a reverential fear of the lord and we see that in genesis chapter 39 verse 9 and uh, he says, he is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he, me talking about Potiphar, nor has he kept anything from me except you, for you are his wife. How then can I do this great evil and sin against God? So Joseph looked at this temptation in the context of how can I do this against God? Not even against Potiphar, not against his father or his mother or his background. Or He looked at it as sinning against God. And I believe that it's only when we have a fear of the Lord, a reverential fear of the Lord that is higher than any other fear, that is stronger, that we put our relationship with God, put a higher premium on our relationship with God than on any other relationship. That is when we're able to overcome and confront and not fall into temptation. So these temptations will come. They do come to all people who seek to 
be used of God and who God is preparing for service and whatever capacity. But I believe that from the life of Joseph, we can see that it is only when we have a reverential fear of the Lord that is higher than any other fear. When we see our lives, our service in relation to God, not just to people, not just to the people we are serving, not just to the people we are working for, not just to the people in, in the congregation, not just to the people in the family, not just to your spouse, your wife or your husband, not just to but to God. And that is when we will be able to confront whatever temptations that we face. So the second or the third stage that Joseph went through in the process was a test, a test of his integrity. And every test is pushing you to the next stage, promoting you to the next stage. Just like in, in school, when you uh, finish a class, you're tested to see if you are ready or if you're worthy to be promoted to the next level. It's the same way in, in spiritual growth. So every stage or process that Joseph went through, there was a test. And many times we go through tests and we don't recognize that they are tests. So the third stage of the process that Joseph went through was a, a test of his integrity. And he was betrayed by the people that he had served, people that he had done no wrong to, people that he had faithfully served and been a steward of but what was really, really going on under the surface is that his integrity was being tested. The fourth stage of the process uh, in the life of Joseph is one that I think that many believers and many people who are in the process or in the journey with God can relate to. And that is a stage of waiting, the waiting season. And in this waiting season, it is very easy to question whether God's word, God's promise, God's vision, God's dream is true or will ever come to pass. Joseph waited in prison. In the Bible, we see other stories of men and women of God who were used, but who had a season in their life of waiting, of just almost feeling like they are forgotten, forgotten by God, forgotten by society, forgotten by their you know, families or the people that they loved. Moses waited uh, 40 years in the wilderness, and I'm sure those years were lonely years and years that he questioned, you know, the plan and the purpose of God for his life. Abraham waited for the promise of God many, many years. And those years are part of the process, the waiting, the silent years, the, the lonely wilderness years where it seems as though, you know, it's so easy to question, where is God? Where is the dream? Where is the vision? Where are all those prophecies that, that I heard? In the waiting, it is easy to feel that God has forgotten you. And the test in the waiting season you see every process, every part of the process has a test. And the test of the waiting season is your faithfulness. Will you be faithful to God even when it looks like he isn't answering your prayers? When it looks like he has forgotten you and everybody else has forgotten you? When it looks like it's, it's not going to come to pass? There is always that, that questioning. Did God really speak to me? If he spoke to me, then why am I here? Why am I in this situation? Why am I alone? Why am I waiting still? Why has it not yet happened? Why has it not yet come to pass? Why am I in this, in this stage? And um, it is a test and it is part of, of the process. And Joseph had to go through that part of the process. And so when he was in prison, and again, he was unjustly imprisoned. He was not in prison for anything that he had done. In fact, he was in prison for doing the right thing. So he was punished for doing the right thing. He was punished for, for having integrity and the fear of God. And, and many times, it, sometimes it looks like that. It looks like you, you, you suffer hardship or persecution for doing the right thing. And so Joseph went through that um, season and it was a test of his faithfulness. And maybe you have gone through such a season or maybe you're even going through such a season right now. And my encouragement to you is that in the end, God always, God always, vindicates, God always promotes, God always remembers and establishes his children and his people when they are faithful, when we are faithful through this season. So every season, every stage of the process has its, its hardships, its difficulties, and um, the season of waiting is no different. But um, I just want to encourage you from Romans chapter 4, verse 20. And this is talking about Abraham. Romans chapter 4, verse 20. And it says, he did not, this is from verse 19, he did not weaken in faith when he considered the impotence of his own body, which was as good as dead, because he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, no unbelief or distrust made him waver. And Amplified, it says, doubtingly question concerning the promise of God. 
but he grew strong and was empowered by faith as he gave praise and glory to God, fully satisfied and assured that God was able and mighty to keep his word and to do what he had promised. So it's just uh, reiterating what we've been sharing and talking about, that Abraham could have doubted God in that season. I mean, it was only natural to doubt, to question, to think, you know, where is God in all this? But Romans uh, 4 verse 20 says, he didn't waver, he didn't, um, he didn't uh, give way to unbelief. Instead, he was strengthened in faith, being completely convinced that God was not only able and mighty, but he was faithful to do what he had promised. And so my encouragement to you is that God is not only able, he's not only mighty enough, but he is also faithful to do whatever he has promised you, whatever you are waiting on God for. He is absolutely faithful and that he will do whatever he has promised. So Joseph went through those stages in the process. And anyone I believe who's used of God will go through a process. There's a kind of purification process to prepare you and I for our service, to prepare us for our assignment and for our calling. So so as we move on, I just want to share with you um, what I believe it entails to be part of of a Joseph company or to be a Joseph in your generation, to be a Joseph in whatever mountain the Lord has called you to. The first, as you've seen from what we've already shared, is where does the vision come from? Where does the vision come from? Now, you may be like Joseph or like David who received the vision from God very early in life when you were young, when you know, like a Samuel who always knew whose life was dedicated from even before they were in the womb. Or you may be um, like many other people who came into their calling a little later in their life and even maybe had to, to change the direction or the path of their life. Um, the disciples were all fishermen, so they had probably thought that they were going to be fishermen all their lives. Maybe their fathers had been fishermen. Maybe they were living in fishing communities and they thought that that was their purpose. Um, when Jesus met Peter, Simon Peter, he said, from now on you will catch men, which just meant that you're not going to be a fisher, uh, a fisherman in terms of catching fish, but you're going to be a fisher of men. So, God, uh, so Jesus in his, in his calling Peter was telling him that your life is going to take a, a different path or a different direction. Paul was uh, a lawyer before he became, you know, the apostle to the Gentiles. So there was a change in, in, there was a shift in his purpose and the plan that he had his own plan and God had another plan. And so he had to align himself with the plan and, and the purpose of God. You see the same with Moses. Moses came into his calling much, much later in his life. So whether you're someone who has always known what the vision of God is, is for your life, or if you're someone who comes in, who came into that vision uh, much later, or if right now you're questioning, uh, asking God, what is your vision for my life? I think the most important thing is the vision comes from God. The vision is not our own. It is not something that we, you know, sit and, and, and strategize and say, according to the prevailing conditions, this, this looks like the best vision. No, God, the creator, your creator and your maker and your father knows the reason and the purpose for which he created you. And therefore it is only through revelation from him and through your, your relationship with him that he can reveal to you and to me what is his vision and his purpose for your life. So the first thing in being a Joseph in your generation is to, to have God's vision. What is God's vision? Because if you are doing something different and if you are in a different path than what God created you to do and created you to, to fulfill, then I, I think it's very difficult to, to be a Joseph because the first part of that is fulfilling God's vision and having and knowing the vision of God for your life. Therefore, it's important for us to, to seek God if we do not know what that is. If we are fighting with God about that vision and that purpose. If we are trying to go our own way, it's very important that we seek God, we spend time with God, and we align our lives to His vision and to His purpose. The second is just following with that. Anyone who is going to do great things for God has to make their relationship with God a priority. Just like Joseph said, I cannot sin against God. His relationship with God was a priority. Intimacy with God. Daniel chapter 11 verse 32 says, Those who know their God 
will do great exploits. And that word knowing is, is about, is, talks about intimacy. Knowing God is not knowing about God. Knowing God is not attending church services. It's not attending overnights. It's not being in, in religious uh, events or functions. Knowing God is, is a relationship. And so prayer and, and, and Bible study and time, time alone with God. There is no way that you, we will come to know God unless we actually spend time with Him, invest time with Him, uh, uh, spend time in prayer, hear from Him, learn to, to commune with Him. So being a Joseph is about... Int- when Joseph was in prison, he didn't have you know, a pastor, he didn't have a fellowship group, he didn't have the weekly fellowship and then the Sunday service and then... He didn't have all the support and the luxury of, of fellowship with, with other believers. All he had in all those years was, was his relationship with God. David said, the deep calls to deep. And I just believe that means that the deep places in God's heart call to the deep places in our hearts. And so knowing God is, is an intimate relationship. We need to be able to, to relate to him one-on-one on on an individual level and it's only our willingness to relate to him in prayer in the private devotions in private time of prayer of bible study of hearing and listening to his voice that is where our strength lies that is where we create deep reservoirs deep pools of refreshing that's where um that's where the our real relationship with god is built david his strength and his relationship with god I believe was forged in the early years of his life when he was on his own in the fields with the sheep and learning to worship God and praise God in the fields. And that private, personal relationship with God, that intimacy is absolutely priceless. And you're able to draw on that for years and years and years to come. So I believe that to be a Joseph in your generation, you have to know God. You have to know God for yourself. You have to to have an intimate relationship with God. Amen. The third, uh, which is really critical and which goes builds from the second, is hearing from God. Now what is interesting is that when you are intimate, when you know someone well, you're able to to hear them clearly, to hear their voice clearly, and to also decipher when it's their voice or when it's not their voice. And um, it is so important to hear from God. And to be a Joseph, you need to be able to hear from God. And I'm just going to share with you two scriptures. One is from the life of Joseph and one is from the life of Daniel. Genesis 41 verse 16, it says, and this is when Joseph now you know, is called out from prison, he's released from prison to come straight to Pharaoh, and he's coming straight to Pharaoh to interpret this dream, the dream that Pharaoh had. Verse 16, Joseph answered Pharaoh. Now, Pharaoh has shared his dream with Joseph, and this is Joseph's answer. Joseph answered Pharaoh, It is not in me, God, not I, will give Pharaoh a favorable answer of peace. So maybe I should just go back a bit. Verse 15 says, And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. And I have heard it said of you, you understand a dream and interpret it. And then Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me, God, not I, will give Pharaoh a favorable answer of peace. Now this is so um, critical. Pharaoh says, I hear that you can interpret dreams. And Joseph said, no, it's not me who can interpret the dream. God, not I. Therefore, he's making it clear that he doesn't have this, you know, innate ability. It is his relationship with God. It's the fact that he hears from God. That alone was what set Joseph up, his ability to hear from God. Because God had, God is the answer and God has the answers. And so our ability to tap in to the the mysteries and the secrets and the wisdom of God for every situation, Joseph said, it's not me, it's God. And therein lies the difference between Joseph and everyone else. And for us to be Josephs, we need to be able to to tap into the wisdom of God, the mysteries of God, the secrets of God. And the only way we can tap into that is hearing from him. So Joseph didn't know. On his own, he didn't know. He didn't have the answer for Pharaoh. But when he heard the dream, God gave him the interpretation. God gave him the answer for the biggest question of his life. And many of us are going to confront or are confronting big questions, big decisions, big um, problems. And we're not on our own. We're not able to 
to solve those problems or to find the answers. And, but what's critical here, Joseph says, it's not me, it's God. And for you today and for me today, we can say, it's not me, it's God. Whatever problem I'm facing, whatever situation I'm facing, whatever question I have, whatever is before me, it's not me, it's God. God will give me the answer for this situation, for this problem that I'm facing. So hearing from God, hearing God's voice is critical to being a Joseph, fulfilling our calling, fulfilling our, you know, the, the, our purpose, our destiny on earth is just linked to hearing from God. Amen. And so we're going to look at Daniel chapter 2, and I'm going to read um, verse 19 and also verse 26. So verse 19 is almost the same situation. Daniel is in Babylon. He's, um, the king has a dream, and he wants Daniel to interpret it. Verse 19, Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night, and Daniel blessed the God of heaven. That just shows again, Daniel did not have the answer. Daniel was confronted with this problem and he didn't know what to do. But in, that, in verse 19 it says, The secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision in the night and Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel knew that God was the one who revealed the vision. Verse 26, The king said to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and the interpretations of it? Again, the same question that Pharaoh had. The king says, I have this dream. Are you able to interpret it? Daniel answered the king, The secret which the king has demanded, neither the wise men, the enchanters, the magicians, nor the astrologers can show the king. That just means that all the wise people, all the you know economists and scientists and, and lawyers and doctors and, 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 and political thinkers and analysts, and nobody has the answer. But verse 28 says, But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to the king what it is that shall be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions in your head upon your bed are these. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than anyone else living. But in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king, that you may know the thoughts of your own heart. Amazing. Daniel is just confessing and saying, it's not, I am not different from any other man. I'm not smarter. I'm not wiser. I'm not, you know, I don't have any specific skill. This is not some kind of, you know, gift that I have that I just know how to interpret dreams. He's basically saying that God has revealed the dream. It's the same thing that Joseph said. It's not me, it's God. Therefore, to be a Joseph in this season, in this generation, we need to be able to hear from God because God is the one who made more than all the other highly skilled people on the mountain that you are on, more than the highly educated people, more than hearing from God is what makes the difference between being a Daniel, being a Joseph, and being anyone else. Amen. Now, as we prepare to conclude, the assignment, what are we talking about? What, what, what is this uh, purpose? What does it mean? So if you're to be a Joseph, what does that mean? To be a, 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 in the company of Joseph, what does it mean? Every person that is called of God, every person that has a call and an assignment on their life is confronted and it often presents itself, the assignment often presents itself as a problem. I want to say it again, the assignment of God often presents itself as a problem. In the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, uh, God told Adam, here is the garden, tend it, work it. So the assignment often appears as something that needs to be fixed or something that needs to be solved and something that is a problem. Sometimes it's, it's something that is, is it's a very dire problem, like the situation with Joseph. His assignment on earth, his assignment was about food security. That's what he was supposed to solve. And all the training and all the wisdom and all the anointing on his life was to solve the problem of food security. Oftentimes in life, there is only one problem. The assignment of your life will be just one. You, you may, it may have different facets, different sort of, you know, parts, but it, it's usually just one issue that God has called you to solve. The problem that catapulted Joseph to his destiny was one of food security. God has called us to be problem solvers. We need to embrace the problem that God has brought to us to solve. As you set about solving the problem that God has placed in front of you, you fulfill your purpose.
purpose. So it's important that we embrace the problem. Many times when we see a problem, our first instinct is to run away from the problem. But I believe that if God has brought something to you as he brought to Daniel, as he brought to, to Joseph, his desire is that working with you, partnering with you, with the wisdom of God working in you and through you, he wants to solve that problem through you. And as he solves that problem through you, you fulfill your purpose. You are promoted. You are established. You are blessed. Why? Because you are fulfilling your God-given purpose. Amen? When God shows you your assignment, begins to highlight a problem that he wants you to solve in any of the mountains of, of, of our society, it could be in the family, it could be in the church, it could be in education or in media or in economy or in government, whatever mountain, where, what, what, wherever it is, God brings something, he puts a burden on your heart and he reveals to you that this is something that he wants you to partner with him in, in solving. The second thing that, that he does is he begins to give you a strategy, a God-given strategy. As you tap into the wisdom of God, he downloads or he gives to you his solution, how he wants you to do it. His solutions are, are usually very uh, simple, profoundly simple. For Joseph, he said, there are going to be seven years of good harvest. Let's take a portion of that harvest and store it. And when we put a, get a portion of that harvest and store it, it will feed us during the seven years lean years a very simple strategy you know profoundly simple now what was interesting is that there were there were very many wise people educated people in egypt but it was it was only through the wisdom of god that this strategy for the salvation of, of the nation was um was revealed therefore the answer the wisdom of god the the, the voice of god it, it does not depend uh, so much on, on on our skill our ability and our education of course it's good to have skill it's good to have ability it's good to have education it's good to apply ourselves but it is god is not limited to those things so god gave a strategy and god will give you and I a strategy to solve, to deal with the problems, the assignments that he has given us. And so it's important for us to, to seek that, to tap into that. And many times, even in our history as a country, God has given our leaders, God has given people that he has called strategies. It can be a natural strategy, such as in the, in the battle again with HIV and AIDS, or it can be a spiritual strategy, as many of our Spiritual leaders have had spiritual strategies in, in attacking spiritual situations. So what I just want to make clear is that God shows, reveals, or, or begins to highlight the problem, and then he gives you a strategy. And that strategy, you know, confronts the problem and deals with that problem. Many times, as we see in the life of Joseph, as we see in the life of Daniel, even in the life of Moses, that one assignment is their lifelong assignment. And they spend the rest of their lives, even after confronting, even after the, the, the bulk of the, the, the battle, or the bulk of the dealing with the problem is, is done, the rest of their life is spent managing and growing the solutions and the resources that they have created in dealing with that problem. So we don't hear about Joseph doing any other thing except being a steward in the house of Pharaoh. We don't hear um, Daniel doing any other thing except being you know, a, a leader, a governor in Babylon. So that call is, is a lifelong call and that assignment is, is a lifelong assignment. And so that there's so much that can be unpacked in that, that God's call, usually it's just one thing. Maybe for people, some people, it may be, you know, they may change here and there, but usually as we see from, uh, from the examples in the Bible, it's just one question, one problem that God wants us to solve. Amen. We... We are going to pray, but before we pray, I just want to talk about the spirit of fear. Because uh, I believe and I feel that people who have come out of a long time of, of being in bondage or being under a, a, a stronghold, a certain stronghold, just like the children of Israel, they came out of Egypt, of slavery, and um, they confronted fear. Fear was a constant um, issue because of what they had come out of. Fear was something that they constantly confronted. I just want to read for you from Joshua chapter 10. Now, this is a generation, the children of those who had come out of bondage. So they had never actually been in bondage. But they too, they, they carried this fear in their hearts. They carried a sense of um, whether it's low self-esteem or just questioning, questioning their abilities, always feeling like they were the, the underdogs, always feeling that they didn't have what it, it, it 
takes to, to succeed. So when they were now uh, possessing the land and conquering the promised land, Joshua did something very interesting, and I want to read for you from Joshua chapter 10, verse 24. And it says, when they brought out those kings, now these are the kings of the lands that they were conquering, to Joshua, he called for all the Israelites, and he told the commanders of the men of war who went with him, come, put your feet on the neck of these kings. And they came and put their feet on the king's necks. And Joshua said to them, fear not, nor be dismayed, be strong and of good courage, for thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom you fight. So just picture this. These are the descendants, these are the children of, of slaves. They are fighting against kings. They are displacing kings. These kings are, have been on these lands for, for generations. God has given them the land. And these children of slaves are displacing the kings. And what does Joseph say? Uh, Joshua, sorry, what does Joshua say? He calls these commanders. These are people who are actively involved actively engaged in this battle. And he says, put your feet on their necks. And then he says, this is what God will do to all of your enemies. And I think, I feel that Joshua wanted to give them confidence. Your foot is on the neck of a king and you have effectively displaced that king. And God's word to you is, you're going to displace all the kings. And he says, fear not, don't be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage. For thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom you fight. And I feel that that's a word for someone who's listening today. And maybe for all of us. That God is effectively putting your feet on the necks of kings, on the necks of people of, 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 of strongholds and principalities and systems that have been ruling on the top of mountains. And the Lord is saying, thus will he do to all your enemies, to all of our enemies. Therefore, be strong. Do not be afraid. Be of good courage. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this word that has gone forth to awaken and stir up the gifts, the dreams and visions in the lives of your children listening today. I pray today that you will confirm the vision and call on the lives of your children that are listening. I also pray that you will empower them to embrace the problem that you have destined them to solve in their generation. Please help us all to hear your voice clearly and bring heavenly strategies to the circumstances we are facing. I pray that today you will commission and release the marketplace movers and shakers of this generation, the Joseph Company that will be shepherds and priests and gatekeepers in the mountains of our society. We pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.